I'm going to read the, <clears throat> excuse me, the entirety of Revelation chapter 13. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads and with seven diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it the dragon gave his power and his throne and his great authority. One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? And the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming the name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them, and authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation, and all who dwell on earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword must he be slain. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people and by the signs it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast. It deceives those who dwell on earth, telling them to make an image of the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Also it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand of the forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. That is the name of the beast or the number of the beast. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who is understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Six, six. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Most heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today. It is a word that word today that is fraught with peril and with an upheaval in the world and we just ask you to guide us as we look at it and how it applies to us and how we need to look at the world through this lens in your holy name we pray amen, amen. the history of the early church is closely tied with the history of the Roman Empire. Now we studied the missionary journeys of Paul. We saw him um, able to travel freely, mostly because of the fact that he was a Roman citizen. We saw how Rome really aided in that sense, not, not in an intentional sense in the spread of the gospel, but because it was pretty much controlled all the known world, that there was ability to travel and the word of God spread throughout the Roman Empire. In many cases when Paul was persecuted in town after town that he went to, both by the authorities and by the Jewish communities, often it was his Roman citizenship that protected him. 
Last week, we looked at Satan being cast down to earth from heaven, and we learned that he exert his power on earth in his efforts to turn people away from God. The dragon, as you know, was waiting for the child to be born and then chased the child off into the wilderness. It is both, in one sense, it is Christ. In the other sense, the child is the community of God after the birth and death and resurrection of Christ that continues on in His name. And as I said, Paul was able to use his Roman citizenship, but eventually even that was not enough. He was eventually arrested. He was shipped off to Rome and the face judgment for his teachings. The dragon from the last chapter of Revelation had lent his power to Rome and what came about from that was one of the most horrendous persecutions in the history of the church. In the initial, when... Christianity was first becoming the, the way, as it was called, in uh, Israel and Jerusalem and the Jewish culture. Satan had tried stopping the, the spread of the word of God and to stop the followers of Jesus with the first great persecutors of the church. And the first great persecutors of the church were the Jewish people, which of course Paul, who was the greatest missionary we have in the, the New Testament, was initially one of those persecutors. He was one of the weapons of Satan against the church. But even as they drove out so many from Jerusalem, we read about that in Acts as they were being driven out of Jerusalem, being driven out of Israel, the disciples and apostles of Jesus found new places to plant the seeds of the Christian religion, the way. They found new ways and new places to sow God's seed. The rule of Rome had made travel safer and easier, and the word of God spread in that first century like wildfire. And here in chapter 13, we are in the second stage of Satan trying to use his power to stop the spread and to stop Christianity. By using the power, and it says the beast that is described here, the leopard, lion, bear, is described here and it is the Roman Empire. The only superpower of the day and it used its power to try and crush the followers of Jesus. And what came about from this was the worst persecution that the church has ever faced. Rome became Satan's agent. And Paul was beheaded. Peter was crucified upside down. Christians were thrown into the arena defenseless to be killed by lions for the entertainment of the people. They were made to stand in the cold until they succumbed to hypothermia. They were drowned in rivers. They were painted with tar and set on fire. Every conceivable torture and death was visited upon those who believed in Christ. In our vacation Bible school a few years ago, we talked about Christians hiding in the catacombs and having their secret symbol, of the, the sign of Jonah, the fish. And they hid in the catacombs. They would have their secret meetings, of, of, of their Christian meetings, down in the catacombs because of the Roman Empire was seeking to utterly destroy Christianity. The might and power of the Roman Empire tried to destroy the church by striking and killing its leaders and by striking fear into its followers. There's an old saying, the tighter you try to grip something, the more of it slips through your fingers. And we know the... the End of the story is, of course, Christianity survived. It not only survived in the Roman Empire, it survived the fall and destruction of the Roman Empire. And this is persecution that is happening in John's current time. The seven churches 
at the beginning of John's revelation are experiencing it. And we're told right there in the very beginning of Revelation that some are even experiencing it unto death, unto martyrdom. This first beast, the leopard bear lion, in this chapter is Rome. The power and the authority of the world. And the world stands against God. I want you to keep in mind that this is our theme that we began Revelation with was already but not yet. <coughs> that there is a prototype of what is going on that informs us of what the future holds for us. That doesn't mean we're going to experience the same exact kind of persecution. But this is the kind of persecution. And we see growing persecution. And the world still tries to separate us from God. Because Satan continues to lend his power to nation after nation and group after group. In order to separate man from God. Because the world stands against God. The second beast that is described here is very different from the first. It is described here as a lamb, but with the voice of the dragon. And the dragon from chapter 12, the same dragon from chapter 12, the same dragon that lends his power to Rome, is speaking with his voice through this lamb. It is a classic wolf in sheep's clothing scenario. The vision of the Lamb, it is parodying, it is making fun of or, or, or showing a parody of Jesus, the true Lamb of God. It looks like the Lamb. That, you know, of course, Jesus is described as the Lamb in Revelation. It looks like the Lamb, but instead it speaks with the devil's voice. The Lamb... The second beast has been identified with so many different things. And that fact alone illustrates the biggest issue I have with the, a pure futurist interpretation. Because besides taking the scripture out of context, it looks at scripture as if it is a secret message to a future generation and sacrifices its meaning to those it was written to. In the history of the church... It has been identified as Satan, as the Antichrist, as the Roman imperial priesthood, as the Catholic Church, and as false teachers. And there was a whole movement during the Reformation to interpret it as the papacy, to interpret it as the Pope and the rule of the Pope. The lens of where the people of God are at different points in history has always colored the interpretation of this passage. So what we need to look at it as is if we are members of these seven churches that this letter is being written to, those that read Revelation in that day were reading it afresh, were suffering this persecution that is already beginning in the Roman Empire. And the light of that helps us to interpret what we are to take from this. And we do know that this beast has a religious role. That the lamb has a religious role. And later in scripture it is called a false prophet. Multiple times in Revelation it's called the false prophet. And we know that it was active in that day. It is working concurrent. It tells us it is working at the same time as the Roman Empire. As the beast identified with the Roman Empire. Now, as I said, remember our theme. Already, but not yet. We don't have carte blanche. We don't have permission to interpret the beast as whatever we want to. But we do recognize the truth that there are elements of our persecutions and the state of the church we can see from the devil of work in the past. What is seen here helps to inform us of what we see today. This beast, this lamb, 
the sheep and wolf's clothing represents deception within the covenant community. And to no surprise, we can see that the community of the seven churches and all the communities that this revelation would be read by, those who it would be done like a circular letter, it would be going not just to the seven churches, but they would then disperse it out to other churches and other bodies worshiping Christ, including ours today. All these communities, the whole of the Christian community throughout time, are affected by deception. And we're affected, as I said, one of the greatest fears is not what's going on without, from without the church, but from within. The first beast is big and blustery and speaks loudly and defiantly against God. The second beast, while it speaks with the voice of the dragon, it's not implying a, it having a loud speech, a blustery speech, but hearken back to the serpent on the tree of a tempting, reasoning voice. It speaks softly, and it seeks to make the first beast claims sound believable. It seeks to say, in today's age especially, that scripture was written 2,000 years ago. It doesn't apply completely to our culture today. It seeks to twist God's words to deceive us. It speaks softly in order to make the claims of the world seem right. The second beast is persuasive. Second beast is often found within the church. False teachers in the church that are encouraging us to compromise with the culture, encouraging us to compromise with the idolatrous institutions of the world. And it is our duty as the church, as a community of believers, to detect the inherent evil of the second beast within our churches today. Two phrases that I thought about is because I've heard them so misused and that one is God is love. And it is true. God is love. God defines love. Love does not define God. God defines love. And the other, God made me this way. So I am being the way that God made me. This and so many other Mantras are used in our society to let sin creep into the world, to justify sin in the world, to say this is right. And getting into Scripture, reading the Word of God, is our defense against this attack upon the church. The worst attacks that we have on the church are usually from within. The attacks that the seven churches were experiencing, the ones that, that John pointed out uh, the most were the ones that were happening within. The people compromising with the world so that they could do business. The people compromising with the world because it was easier to keep the gospel to themselves and not worry about persecution than it was to share the word of God with others. Our call as Christians is to seek to discern true from false worship. And we do this in order to preserve our faith. The world's always going to be telling us something different. Sometimes the world is that big blustery beast that just tells them, oh, no, that, that's, that's not right. But more often it is that soft voice of the lamb-like beast. And it tells us, yeah, it's right. Just look at it from this perspective. Let's apply our culture to the Bible instead of applying the Bible to our culture. Let's listen to what the world says instead of what God says. Because that is just a 2,000-year-old book that applied to them but doesn't apply to us. 
And that is why we need to get into Scripture. Because even though, you know, I said I don't, I don't apply a futurist interpretation to chapter 13, there is that futurist aspect. We experience the same persecutions, the same struggles of the world against Christianity that they did in their day. And while we don't experience the, the, the incredible tortures and what was going on in the Roman, Roman Empire, there are nations that do. That experience this persecution in a much more physical way than we do. Which is why as Christians we need to pray for them. We need to arm ourselves so that it doesn't happen in our country down the line. That we are armed with the word of God. And to let other Christians know and the world know us by our love. That we share what we have without fear. That we share the word of God, the true word of God. You know, today's lamb speaks to us and says, well, if you're pushing the word of God, you're spreading hate. Because you're going against things that but we're supposed to love the people and hate the sin. And to push back against sin because we are here to share the word of God in truth. Not in part. Not just the parts that people feel good about. Not take it out of context so that it'll apply to whatever they want. Because the devil can use scripture just as well as anybody else can. And better than most. But to use God's word fully in conjunction with the Holy Spirit that we pray for and we let into our heart whenever we're doing Bible study, studying the Word of God, or sharing God with other people. Let us pray. Holy Father, in this world we know that it is against you, that it pushes hard against you, we ask you for the strength to be able to be prepared for that. Help us, Lord, to get into the, your word and help us to pray more and to spend more time with you. And most of all, Lord, help us to share you fearlessly in this world. In your holy name we pray. Amen. At this time, I will call us to order as a... For a brief meeting, and let me even cut off that camera for, for church meeting.